Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, so I think it'd be nice to start off by introducing myself first. My name is Anna. I'm a second year undergraduate student here at UCL studying applied medical sciences. Um, so these sessions are designed to inspire you into, I guess, um, the world of medical sciences. I am very excited to host um, Professor McHugh or Tim here today, who is the director of um, the Centre of Clinical Microbiology in the Division of Infection and Immunity here at UCL. Um, I don't know if you can recall, Professor McHugh, but you were one of my um, guest lecturers for one of my modules this year, and he was just teaching us everything about tuberculosis and SARS-CoV-2, which is obviously very topical at the moment. Um, it's the very reason why we're all kind of talking to each other through screens right now rather than, you know, sitting um, in our lecture theatres. Um, but with um, a background in microbiology, uh, Professor McHugh's research focuses on um, the improved diagnosis and treatment of microbial infections, particularly in antimicrobials and the evolution of antimicrobial um, resistance. So we have the pleasure to have Professor McHugh enlighten us about it. OK, thank you, Anna. Thank you for that kind introduction. And I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed my lectures uh, done earlier this um, this year, in earlier in the academic year. And as um, Anna said, actually, my main interest is uh, uh, my main bacterium of interest, if you like, is um, tuberculosis. But um, fundamental to that is this issue of um, antimicrobial resistance and my title is self-explanatory. You know, we've been thinking about COVID for the last year and other issues have been forefront in our mind. But actually in the background, antimicrobial resistance is a pandemic which is still growing and is still of cause for concern for us. And I hope that today I'll show you some examples of where it's important and also a little bit about the mechanisms through which uh, antimicrobial resistance emerges. So the first point is that, is that nothing's new, really. Uh, Alexander Fleming, who you'll all be familiar with, uh, who got his Nobel Prize for uh, discovering uh, penicillin, a chance chance finding. Uh, he left some cultures growing in his lab and, and observed the effect of the penicillin um, fungus on, on some bacteria that were growing. At his Nobel lecture when he was accepting his Nobel Prize, he he foresaw or described the emergence of antibiotic resistance. And here it is, it's not difficult to make microbes resistant to penicillin in the laboratory. And that's something we do regularly in our laboratories uh, as part of our experiments. If we want to find, if we want to explore antimicrobial resistance, it's fairly easy for us to expose bacteria to the antibiotics and select for resistance. And the important thing there is that as Alexander Fleming, it, well, he actually said the same thing has occasionally happened in the body. The reality is that it happens very often in the body. And we'll explore some of those ideas as we go through this session today. So, but before we go into the bi microbiology, if you like, let's just think about the scale of the problem. And here's, here's some data from uh, the British government published in 2019, and it just gives you an idea. So uh, if we're thinking about drug resistant TB, 123 countries have reported extensive multi-drug resistance. That's really important. Here's a figure which is very critical. 700,000 people are estimated to die from drug resistant infections each year. That's global figures. That's a significant number of people. Um, and particularly important, 2 billion people lack access uh, to antimicrobials in low, low and middle income countries. So people in the poorest situations, in the most resource poor set settings, have uh, don't access microbials, uh, antimicrobials. And importantly, is if you're not getting good access, then that's when resistance can arise. But look, this is the most, most important th message here. There's not been a new class of antibiotics discovered and used in, a, in routine use since the 1980s. So what's that, 40 years, maybe more than that, we haven't created a new type of antibiotic with which to deal with this pandemic. So in the race between drug resistant bacteria and man, actually the drug resistant bacteria are winning at the, at the moment. WHO have identified 
eight bacteria that they consider of particular importance and they use these eight bacteria listed here as the bacteria which we use to signal uh, the efficiency or the uh, success of antimicrobial control strategy. So antimicrobial, the, the tools we use for controlling antimicrobials. And there's a term um, which I should have put on the screen, which is antimicrobial stewardship. And that's the process by which we manage the use of antibiotics and how they're rolled out in a, within a healthcare system to avoid or minimize the effect of antimicrobial resistance. So antimicrobial stewardship, and these are the bugs which we use as signals or indicators in order to evaluate those systems. And many of them will be familiar to you. E. coli, obviously, Neisseria, um, and also Streptococcus and Staphylococcus, commonly known infectious agents that we're all, all, all very familiar with. And the future does look, look grim. Many of you will have heard of the report uh, by Jim O'Neill in 2014, um, Tackling a Crisis for Health and Wealth of Nations, Antimicrobial Resistance. This famous report actually reset the government's approach to antimicrobial resistance and triggered the thought that actually this is a real problem. This is something we really need to focus on. And here's that 700,000 data. And what Jim O'Neill predicted was that by 2050, there'd be 20, 10 million deaths uh, associated with antimicrobial resistance, 10 million deaths attributable to, attributable to, and to antimicrobial resistance each year um, by 2050. So that's a building risk that we have to have to deal with at this stage to avoid that. And if you're worried about money, you can. this shows the total GDP loss over that same time period. And this blue phase here shows the loss of income to globally associated with, with with antimicrobial resistance. So it's not only having an impact on communities and individuals, um, but it's also having an effect on the ability of that community to, to function, to pay for its needs to, to operate. So that's big data and, and big, big numbers. And actually, it's important for us to think about uh, these on an in, what the impact of the of antimicrobial resistance on an individual basis. And um, to illustrate that, I think about my mother, who sadly now has passed away, but when she was in her 70s, she was due for a hip operation. And she went to her local, in the Midlands, she went to her local sur uh, surgeon to have that hip or operation. But the hospital wasn't able to do her operation that year because of the risk of antimicrobial resistance. So what they said was, you have set your lady in her, she was in her late 70s, you have these comorbidities, you've got other things going on. The risk of you coming in and having this operation at this time is associated with too high a risk of you getting resistant at that time, it was MRSA. So they put off her hip operation for another year until they got that situation under control. And it's important to remember that personal impact that can have. So that meant that my mother for an extra year had that pain, had that dis dysfunction in her hip, and that was quite critical to her at that stage. So although we can think about these big numbers, you know, 10 million people, 700,000 at this stage, it's important to think of the local, and I'm sure if you think about your families, your local, the people around you locally, you'll see people who are impacted on a daily basis by the risk of antimicrobial resistance. So let's think about some of the biology. And here we've got a little graphic from uh, Rygart's uh, nice paper demonstrating the mechanisms of resistance. And so how does a bacterial cell avoid an antibiotic working or killing it? Well, the first thing it can do is to have efflux pumps to pump the antibiotic away. So you, you increase the efficiency of the efflux pumps which are at the surface of the, of the bacterial cell and they pump out any, any antibiotic that gets in. So they get rid of it quickly. And a good example of this are the TET determinants which are improved efflux pumps which get rid of tetracyclines. An alternative version of that is demonstrated by this graphic here which is where you have pumps which actually block the, the uptake of a drug. An example of that are the 
OPRD genes, uh, proteins, which are porines, which mediate the uptake of uh, molecules, and they block, they preferentially block imipenin, which is a particular antibiotic. So you've got increased expulsion and also blocking of uptake. Then you've got bugs, bacteria, which can inactivate the, the drug. So and there's got two examples of this here. Famously, the penicillins, as we were talking about Alexander Fleming earlier, these have these are their activity is limited by the release of beta lactamases by the host cell, and and chloramphenicol uh, can be inhibited by the, the by production of specific acetyl transferases. So these are molecules released and produced by the bacterial cell, which de diminish the effect of the antibiotics and, and inactivate it. And then the final version, the final mechanism is where the, the target for the drug is modified. So the example I've given here are the quinolones, which target the gyrase genes. Now the gyrase genes are actually not here at the surface. They're in the, they, they are associated with coiling and supercoiling of DNA. And if you block those with a quinolone, that, what normally happens is they, they're blocked and that stops the DNA reorganizing itself in cell division. However, if you get a mutation in the JRA or the JRB gene, then that blocks the activity of those quinolones. And so you modify the drug target and that stops the antibiotic working. So these are the fundamental mechanisms, types of mechanisms that you can have, which uh, encode or, or develop resistance. Now resistance, so if I go back, what we see here is different sorts of um, molecular mechanisms driven by particular changes in the in the target molecules and the target DNA. So specific single mutations drive these gyra gyrb mutations, where some of the other components are associated so associated with whole gene changes or whole lump se sequences changing. And so we see resistance arising through mutation or indeed through sharing of resistant encoding DNA. And we see that using MGEs, mobile genetic elements often. And these can be plasmids, circles of DNA in the bacteria. They can be trans transposed on small pieces of DNA, which go, which get incorporated into the chromosomal DNA and change its activity. Or even phages, which are, are viruses, which attack, attack bacteria and carry the DNA from, <laughs> it says here, germ to germ. This is because I nicked this slide from uh, the uh, CDC. What, what, of course, what we're talking about here is bacteria. So you've got these mobile genetic elements and they can move between bacteria and transfer that antibiotic resistance. And this is what you're seeing here in this in this slide. You're seeing that sort of transfer of DNA and it can be while well, the phages head off into the outside world and they inoculate into the next bacterial cell. At conjugation, you can get um, where cells have joined together, you get transfer of DNA from one cell to the other. And then you also get a transformation, get DNA being transmitted into the outside world and then being picked up by a host cell, another bacterium. So it's important, and we'll come back to this theme later, that in bacterial communities, you see DNA and encode, encoding resistance moving between those cells. So um, as Anna kindly pointed out, and as I've mentioned, tuberculosis is my uh, is my the main area of my research. And I wanted to spend a bit of time thinking about TB because drug resistant TB is really important. And TB is a disease in its own right, which is important, but drug resistant TB is a real challenge for us. And I want the, to use this example to illustrate how the biology of an organism affects its interaction with antibiotics and therefore leads to the evolution of drug resistance. Now, the important thing about TB is it doesn't have any of those mobile genetic elements. Resistance only arises through mutation. So we see, so it makes it quite easy, uh, not easy, but it makes it fairly a good model to explore resistance with. Just to remind you of how important uh, TB is. 10 million new cases each year with around about 1.2 million deaths. So um, 
in the competition for uh, most serious pathogen in the world, TB is up there with malaria, HIV, and of course now SARS-CoV-2. So TB, actually in the 1940s, um, treatment for TB looked good. There was this new drug, streptomycin, available, and it seemed to have really good effect and protect against tuberculosis. And this is a paper from 1948. And this is the first, now you may have heard of randomised control. Well, you will have done because you've been listening to the news and been listening to um, all the stuff about the control trials that have been doing for vaccine development. And actually the first properly randomised control trial uh, was this one done by the British Medical Research Council for the streptomycin treatment of pulmonary tuberculosis, published in 1948. And this study demonstrated that streptomycin treatment cured or appeared to cure TB use of this one drug. However, as they were publishing this, they were already beginning to see streptomycin resistance in pulmonary TB. So this paper by the same group um, was published just four months later, uh, three months later. So this is October 1948 and this one is December 1948. So already they were seeing evidence of drug resistance occurring. And in fact, that meant that streptomycin alone was no longer considered an appropriate treatment for tuberculosis because it just didn't work. So quite soon after that, they started to develop the concept of combination drug therapy. So you start, you don't only use streptomycin, but you use another drug, in this case, uh, what we call PAS, paramino salicylic acid, and you use them in combination to, to treat the, the uh, disease, the infection. And the combination of drugs was seen to mop up the, so those bugs which were streptomycin resistance would be killed by the PAS. Now, PAS has gone out, streptomycin is still used for TB treatment. PAS has gone out of fashion because it's actually really very unpleasant to take and it makes people feel sick. So it went out of fashion. It occasionally reappears on the agenda, but um, is, is out of fashion at the moment. So the good news is, so from that work, PAS went out of fashion, but by the uh, 1960s, we had a good regime of four drugs, um, rifampicin, isoniazid, streptomycin, and um, ethambutol to treat, um, or ethambutol or pyrazinamide uh, to treat um, TB. And these four drugs used in combination, this is the good news, TB is curable. So for most people who get drug sensitive TB and take their drugs properly and are given good quality drugs, they will get better. So 86, this is the UK data, 86% of you people in the UK who had treatment, uh, completed their course of treatment, and they could reasonably expect to get better from their TB. TB is curable with antibiotics. And complete the treatment. If you don't complete the treatment, you run the risk of drug resistant tuberculosis. You run the risk of transmitting to your friends and family, and ultimately you have increased disease and, and death. Bad news. Those four drugs, rifampicin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and streptomycin, or ethambutol, um, are unpleasant. All of them are fairly unpleasant. I've never taken them myself, but my colleagues who are clinicians and have patients tell me that they are pretty unpleasant to take. So, and many of you will know that if you start taking, if you take a normal course of antibiotics, you know, seven days, 14 days, actually after a few days, you begin to feel better. And so then the driver to take those drugs is is diminished. So, but these drugs, in order to treat TB, you have to do it for six months. You take four drugs for two months, and then another, and then just two of the drugs, isoniazid and rifampicin, for a further four months. And the burden of treatment is really bad. And so people fail their treatment, they don't take all the drugs, it's too complex, and ultimately you have people failing. This six to 24 months, six months is drug sensitive TB, 24 months is drug resistant TB. In order to try and deal with this, the WHO introduced DOTS, which is direct observed therapy short course. I always think the short course is ironic because we're talking about six months as opposed to 18 months. And this is where, uh, depending on where you are in the world, you observe taking your TB therapy to try and make sure that you do take it and that it goes down properly and that you take that therapy properly. 
And of course, a further complication is drug interactions with HIV treatment. treatment. Now, we don't have much time, to, we don't have time to go into that today, but HIV coexists with TB as a pathogen. And importantly, um, not only do the drugs interact, but also the biology of these two organisms overlaps. And so you get more severe disease. All that adds up to the evolution of multidrug resistant tuberculosis. Each year we're seeing around about half a million people developing drug resistant TB and very few of those are diagnosed globally and only one in nine are successfully treated. And so this is having a big impact on the TB community. And of course, if you've got drug resistant TB circulating, then that will exacerbate. It will build up over time. So why why does TB become resistant? I told you it is resistance occurs due to mutations. So it's random mutations occurring in the in the genes which encode resistance. So for example, that gyrase gene for uh, the quinolones. And there's it's the unique biology of TB which drives this. And um, so we can see um, the cell wall of TB is really t is is a real issue. And you see uh, the cell wall is fatty and antibiotics just can't get in. TB grows very slowly and that means its physiology resists standard antibiotic therapy. The organisms are in granulomas in the lungs. And so that means that drugs don't get in in, the full, full, in their full force. And then finally, we have this, this situation. This is the numbers of bugs in sputum after a patient has been treated. And you can see a rapid decline, and then you see this persistent area here. And we've done some work on that, and it's a conundrum for us. We couldn't work out whether this is one population of bacteria which is changing as a result of drug treatment, or two population, two distinct populations, one which is killed rapidly, and the other one which persists, the persistence. We looked at the gene expression of patients who had been treated with standard therapy for TB. And there's a lot of data on the slide. I don't have time to go in, in, in detail. But the message from this is this is looking at the genes being expressed by the drug, by the bugs following treatment. And we got distracted by this day three peak here. But in fact, what we found was that the, the drugs were treated, the organisms were responding to the drugs in two different populations. There was one population highlighted by this peak here, which were responding very rapidly to the drugs, but a lot of the organisms were not responding to the drugs or rather continued to respond in the normal way. So they're sort of indifferent to drug treatment. So there's too much data on that slide. So this illustrates that. So our hypothesis was that it could be one population which changes, which would be represented by that day three curve where you see a big peak in a change or two distinct populations with some being killed and some persist persisting. And actually that transcriptomic data demonstrated this effect that you've got one population that changes. And actually that you, that you've not got one population that changes, you've got these two distinct populations and leading to these persisters. So these are being killed rapidly, but these are persisting and leading to the evolution of antibiotic resistance. So I'm not going to say much more on TB, but what I wanted to show you was this. So the good news is with TB is that there's a there's a, a TB pipeline producing new, new drug regimes. And the important thing about this slide is that all of these are being done at the moment and the mixtures of drugs. So it's not to try and reduce the evolution of drug resistance. We're using mixtures of drugs, mixtures of combinations. And many of these are, are trials, trials that we're involved in. A piece of really good news is so no new class of drug, I, I said at the beginning, no new class of drug has been produced. However, for the first time we have in for a long time, we, the FDA have, has approved a new drug for highly drug resistant forms of TB and this is Protominid and we were involved in the evaluation of this drug in clinical trials and some of the basic biology as it was evolved as it was being evaluated through the clinical trials. So just to, to blow our own trumpet for a second, these are some of the studies. This is really to say these are things that we're doing uh, led by my group at UC, uh, the Centre for Clinical Microbiology and my colleagues at the MRCCTU. And these are clinical trials moving the, di the, the conversation forward for TB, addressing the issue of drug resistance. So to change pace for a second, let's think about hospital transmission of infection. So 
so moving away from the effects, so I've tried to illustrate for TB that it's the organism is important, but one of the really important things is in hospitals, what we're seeing is transmission of infection as a result of genes being shared. Remember this graphic from earlier of ge genetic elements being moved around. And this slide from Antibiotic Research UK shows a range of hospital bugs, the hospital infection superbugs, which have got multiple drug resistances, which lead to the transmission and poor outcomes for patients who get these infections whilst they're actually in hospital. So transmission of bacteria, so you've got transmission of the, of the drug resistance elements between the bugs, but of course we've got transmission between between people. And this this is this is uh, from a book by, called Dr. Dog, who's a famous doctor. And this picture of these children illustrates the problem, not just of children, these are the Gumboyle family. And of course we transmit infections amongst ourselves. And you'll have been familiar, so in the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, you'll, you'll, you'll all have seen these pictures. And these are ITU staff, dressed in personal protective equipment to protect them from the transmission of COVID-19, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, from their patients. And we, I mean, this is a picture from BBC News and this is ITU and you can see the, the, the nursing staff and doctors working on the patient and protecting them themselves. But there's no unforeseen consequence of that. And that role reversal of PPE has led to a led to a problem. So the PPE is being used to protect the healthcare workers from the SARS-CoV-2 that the patients are transmitting. And that's that's exactly as it should be because it's a dangerous situation. However, normally in an ITU situation or in any ward, we would be using PPE to protect the patients from us. So we'd be washing our hands, we'd be wearing gowns and changing them between seeing patients. And that's led to this situation. Now, this is what we've seen at the Royal Free and is, uh, but has been observed around the, the, the world actually, where we've seen um, as a result of doubling ICU capacity and the role reversal for PPE, we see increased observation of um, colonization with infections. Um, so here we've got Serrata, Klebsiella, and we're seeing in hospital transmission and both in hospital transmission and antibiotic selection pressure. So we've got an ongoing study looking at the conventional epidemiology, um, using conventional epidemiology to monitor those infections around patients and also using whole genome sequence analysis to identify the links between those isolates. And we're doing that study at the moment, so I can't report the data for you, but we're looking at the observance of this movement of uh, resistant genotypes between patients. And we're using that using this neat system for sequencing. So the final point that I want to make in the last few slides is, about, is the fact that the, no one is alone, no bacterium is alone. They live in communities and they drive that resistance. So going back to this graphic, these bacteria share their resistances with each other. And they can do that by sharing genes or they can do that by building 3D structures which protect them. So here's, here's the 3D structure that we're familiar with, and these are biofilms. So these are scanning electron micrographs, which I picked up from the web, of biofilms of uh, bacteria, creating 3D structures which protect the bacteria and create micro environments which protect the bacteria from antibiotics. And so we see them becoming resistant. Now here's a wound infection with a biofilm formed in it, and here, as just by example, is a pipe with a biofilm informed in it. And we can see that organisms in biofilms change their response to drugs. And so this is some work from an MSC student of mine, actually. You can just about see the biofilms in this picture here. And this is isoniazid treatment. And we can see from these, this data that the bugs growing in the biofilms are less susceptible to antibiotic than those which are growing in the free form. So the biofilm protects from antibiotics. The, fi the final tool is fitness. So it's often said that bugs that are growing, that are resistant to, to back antibiotics are less fit than those which are, um, that have got, um, which are the wild type. And this is um, Burkholderia, which causes biofilms in, in the lungs of cystic fibrosis patients. So here's some pictures of biofilms forming. And 
here's some data that uh, Cassie Pope, who some time ago was my PhD student, and she looked at the fitness of uh, these bugs in these biofilms as they acquired resistances. And interestingly, she demonstrated that fitness was not impaired by the resistance genotype. So you're going to not going to get the wild type overrunning the resistant one in this setting. So fitness is important, but not always. Drug bugs are not always less fit if they are carrying resistances. And the final point about populations is that we have these microbiomes where bugs are, grow, are, 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 are together. They're growing together. We tend Medical microbiologists often focus on one particular organism. I've spoken a lot about TB today and you think about the diagnostic process about one organism, but increasingly we're beginning to see the impact of populations of bacteria, not only because they're sharing their drug resistance phenotypes and their genotypes and, and sharing their genes which encode resistance, but because they the, the balance, the ecology of the environment changes in the presence of these. And this is work from Sylvia, who um, actually just got her PhD last week. And she was looking at micro, microbiome communities in uh, the lung, and different sorts of diseases of the lung. And this graphic here is just showing you how in the healthy patient, and the healthy person, you've got one combination of organisms. And in another, in various disease forms, that that dynamic, that bi microbiome changes and you get what we call dysbiosis. And that might be the predominance of another, another group of organisms and they may be associated with drug resistance. So it's that unbalance which becomes important. So to summarise, antimicrobial resistance is a natural evolutionary process. It occurs all the time, as Alexander Fleming illustrated. You can demonstrate it very quickly. I hope, to, I think today I've tried to show you the biology, how important the biology of an individual organism is. So the biology of tuberculosis drives drug resistance for that organism. With the story about COVID, um, ITU wards, I hopefully have shown you the importance of the role of transmission in spreading of antimicrobial resistance in particular environments. And then finally, looking at biofilms and the microbiome, we've had a think about the importance of bacterial community. It's important to remember that AMR is having significant societal effects and that the threat is import is there and it's not gone away. It's not gone away while we, we've been looking at COVID. So whilst we've been looking over here at COVID-19, AMR has always been in the background as a threat to us. We've forgotten about it, but it's definitely not gone away. Thank you. That's my last slide. Um, we've got quite a popular question coming from ASME. Thank you, ASME. Um, but with how um, versatile uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing um, system is, uh, could CRISPR-Cas9 technology be potentially used to target antibiotic resistance genes in bacteria? do you think? Well, yes, so I mean, that's right. So um, there is quite a lot of work. Uh, so, so that um, gene editing system is, is really very versatile and it is being used not only to explore drug resistance, but also as a tool to, de to um, deliver um, further antibi antibiotic effects, if you like. So yes, very definitely. And there, there are examples of people using, use, beginning to use that in that setting. I guess the, the question is, from a practical point of view, is how you deliver that, how you deliver that system as, a, as an antimicrobial agent, how it gets delivered. Um, and so that's, that's the element that is, requires some further thought and further attention. OK, um, we've also got quite a topical one revolving around vaccines. Um, so are the principles of antimicrobial resistance applied in vaccinations? And if not, could they be? So the principles of so. Um, the, so the principles as to how antimicrobial resistance evolves can apply into if that's the, the direction of the question. So if yeah. that's what's being asked. So, yes, of course. So vaccines are are simply molecules which select and target organisms um, through specific receptors or specific aspects of their, their um, 
structure. And so if those are flexible in terms of evolution, then then you can get then you can get avoidance of the vaccine. So we don't see it very often in bacterial vaccinations because bacterial vaccinations tend to be focused on complex combinations of proteins and, and complex. So, for example, BCG, which is the TB vaccine, is a whole organism. So there's multiple targets involved. Um, obviously, people are thinking about COVID and there you're talking about anti antibody um, uh, vaccines targeting single units or small areas of protein. And it's that then you do stand the chance of getting what they call breakout mutants. You get the chance of a, vac a vaccine not picking up the new mutant and so therefore it's happening. And so that's so antimicrobial resistance is essentially evolution and selection and that's what's yeah. happening with those with those vaccines so it's about you know we if we strip it back it's about evolution and and selective uh, evolution yeah so on that note of um evolution we've got a slightly philosophical one here um with the rate of bacterial evolution do you think that humans thousands of years ago would have had immune systems um able to cope the same way that they can now so, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. So you could argue that, so um, there's an argument that goes now, which is that we actually have um, made our immune system not so efficient by being too clean. So we live in a world where we clean ourselves, uh, particularly now where we're using um, hand sanitizers, we're not exposing ourselves, we're not, so so we're living in a very clean world and there's an, an argument that goes that we really need to expose ourselves to more yeah. uh, of the environment to, to develop to develop our immune system. So I don't know the strict answer to that question. One could argue though that you know in previous times as we as man was evolving and living very much in conjunction with the environment then actually that exposure might have been driving them to have a, a more enhanced immune response and a more a stronger protective immune response and of course we've seen some pathogens evolve alongside man so not necessarily well some bacteria definitely are very well adapted to living in man without causing disease we have all these commensals which don't cause disease because they've evolved alongside us. And if you step into the world of parasites, you see organisms which are actually quite big and quite um, intrusive, not eliciting any any significant immune response. And that's because they've evolved alongside man for, for millennia. Yeah, I think um, it's becoming kind of like a growing research interest with like commensals and the human microbiome. Um, so we've got a question on that. Um, so there's increasing evidence that antibiotics um, does not only harm the bad bacteria, but also they're shown to kind of wipe out the good bacterial populations in our body. Um, so then are probiotics really important for our health? Yes, so that's, I mean, that's a really good point um, that the balance that a healthy body has got a balance of bacteria which are doing which are synergistic with us uh, or at least doing no harm and when you disturb that then you see quite severe you can see quite severe disease a good example in the hospital setting are are uh, clostridium difficile infections which are a result they exa are exacerbated as a result of antibiotic therapy and it's a it, it creeps in and it disturbs the the gut microbiome and so so probiotics, whether they specifically are the thing, the solution, probiotics being a group of organisms which have been identified to be have a positive effect. Um, so they may be useful and there are studies looking at the use of probiotics to to rebalance a person's uh, gut microbiome after they've had a, an instance. So there, there may be value in there and they possibly a healthy balanced diet will give you an equal amount of useful organisms to or encourage a healthy uh, gut microbiome as well. So I think that whether specific probiotics are good or not is is what is a, is a very specific question but in general getting that balance of your mi gut microbiome is really important and we see that we see that dysbiosis is is 
is an exacerbation of disease. Yeah. Um, so, Professor McHugh, you mentioned that um, kind of this combination and antibiotic therapy to kind of cover all bases um, as a form of treatment. But what is actually being done in the UK, do you know, to try and minimise the spread and like the development of um, antibiotic resistance? So there's there's a lot actually. I mean the the biggest effort, and I, I regret when I put the slides together that I didn't give more time to antibiotic stewardship, um, because antibiotic stewardship is the process by which um, healthcare professionals and organisations manage the distribution of antibiotics and the treatment of um, of patients, so that the it's a rational and organised release, so that you only give antibiotics to the right people. So. Um, I haven't presented it today, but um, hold it. I'm just going to. I just need to. Excuse me. So um, I haven't demonstrated it today, but my clinical colleagues who work in um, at the World Free Hospital and UCLH, they spend a lot of their time agreeing what antibiotics should be used under what circumstances and how much and who should get them, and then tracking the resistant organisms and making sure that that's it. And this is antibiotic stewardship. It's about making sure that we don't waste our antibiotic supplies and develop loads and loads of drug resistant organisms. And actually the UK is quite good at it and a lot of, a lot of places are, are quite good at that process. Alongside that is the constant quest for new antibiotics, which is tough, but is, is developing, and also tools to work out how we might deal with antibiotic resistance, how we might monitor it, how we might treat it. All the things you're seeing on the telly about COVID, you know, how, how you know, tracking and tracing resistant organisms, uh, having system diagnostic tests done rapidly to, to make sure that you manage those patients properly. So all that stewardship and management of patients is coming into place. And I mean, in the UK, we are very good at managing that process. In other parts of the world, actually, the access to antibiotics is, is random and relaxed and so people can just get what they like and then you see resistance emerging very rapidly. Yeah, so um, obviously antibiotic use, we don't just see it in humans, but we also see it in all other industries like livestock and obviously in modern society with globalisation um, and kind of like farming industries. To what extent um, is widespread antibiotic use in livestock feed contributing to antimicrobial resistance? And is this a front that we should focus our energy on to combat? Yeah, no, it's, it's very definitely something we need to think very carefully about. I, I mean, there are there are significant attempts to manage the use of antibiotics in the, the veterinary world and in the animal care world and avoid the um, use of antibiotics for anything other than treating infections. The trouble with antibiotics have been used as growth promoters and some countries still allow that and they are used not necessarily as growth promoters but they use prophylactically in, in low doses in some settings and that's an area which is controversial and being explored and studied and also a, a, a target for regulation. You know, I, a few years ago, I was involved in a, a podcast, which was a conversation between medical microbiologists, people like me, and uh, and veterinary microbiologists. And what was interesting is that uh, the medical microbiologists tend to focus on individuals. So we think of, we start with the individual patient yeah. and managing an individual patient. The veterinary people, they were talking about herds of cattle and the and shed loads of chickens mm. and they deal at the community level to start with and that changes the conversation to some extent and the way they manage their infections so they will give low dose antibiotics to a whole herd of cattle under certain circumstances and so there's there's I'm not saying that that's wrong it might be necessary but there's a, there's a need for regulation and control and an understanding of the impact of that on 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 actually one health which one health is the term which covers the animal world as well as the human world and it's an area which is developing um 
and we see movement of so i'm involved in a study in tanzania where we're seeing movement of uh, staphylococcus aureus which is a skin infection drug resistant staphylococcus aureus moving between the chicken population and the and the farmers who manage those chickens so you're seeing backwards and forwards between those populations and that's really important we really need to get a grip on that i think is the fair the fair thing to say what's the name of the podcast again sorry I can't, I can't remember. It's a couple of years ago. It was, it was, the, it was in uh, Veterinary Record and the BMJ, and it was a meeting of veterinary people. I'll, I'll find the correct details of it and give them to you. Yeah, um, I'll probably give, give it a listen <laughs> sometime yeah. soon. Um, so you talked about how bacterial DNA can be shared through uh, phages. So how viable, how viable is it that the use of bacterial phages in fighting bacteria and treating bacterial infections. Yeah, that's that's interesting, isn't it? Because so I showed that as an example of DNA being moved around and bacteriophages is, is coming to fashion. So bacteriophages were always used in the Eastern Europe, or not always, but have been long, long time. There's a big, there's a famous phage institute in, in Tbilisi in Georgia. And so behind the old Iron Curtain, they used phage a lot. Um, it's le it was less fashionable in the West but is increasing now. And in, in fact, in recently, uh, Great Ormond Street, they treated a patient who, who had mycobacterium abscessus infection, which they just couldn't get on top of. So that what they did was they, they developed some phage, which was lytic to that uh, mycobacterium, that specific mycobacterium abscessus. So it killed that mycobacterium abscessus. So phage, so that worked, it's published in Nature, and it was a really neat piece of work to, to treat an individual. But we're building, so there's a big population of people now beginning to think about phage and its, and its value as a antimicrobial. There's some governance questions about, you know, inserting another organism, another virus, if you like, into, into a patient to treat a, a bacterium. We need to work that out. But in fact, one of my colleagues, uh, Giovanni Satter, who's a consultant at uh, UCLH, he's just embarking on a project uh, looking at uh, phage treatments for mycobacteria and how they can be used exactly to try and deal with those strains which have got developed antibiotic resistance and we've got nothing left. We've got nothing left in our armory. So these are big extreme examples. So there's some technical difficulties around how you use phage and how you apply it. But I think I'm, well, I'm hoping to be doing some exciting work over the next few years on it. Um, so I think we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, but with those images of like biofilms of whole bacterial communities that I saw on your PowerPoint, um, can the growth of one microbe kind of prevent the growth of another? Can they um, outcompete each other? Like, let's say a cold virus can outcompete um, COVID, let's say. Yeah, so uh, talking about bacteria rather than viruses, if you don't, yeah. uh, just because that's more my, so, um, so we do see that. And I sort of, I, I have to admit, I rushed a little bit through the fitness argument. So there is this idea. So you might have different species competing. So the idea of fitness is classic Darwinian fitness. You know, organism A is fitter and a, more able to grow in an environment than organism B. And that might be two different species. So you might have an infectious agent which is, uh, or a pathogen which is outgrown by a commensal and so so doesn't have its effect and what happens is in di in dysbiosis is something has happened to upset that by situation so the 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 pathogen becomes more fit in that environment we had an ex there's an example of this actually from some work that um, another of my phd students did some while ago um, at, uh, at the Royal Free, there's a community of pa a cohort of patients who have primary primary immunodeficiency. So these are it's a whole there's a group and it's a specialist centre for managing these patients. So they have inherited disorders which make them. And we were seeing in those patients a novel mycoplasma, a novel organism which was resistant to antibiotics. It's intrinsically resistant to antibiotics, and. It was interesting because when we uh, when Claire Ling, who was the student exploring this, when she investigated it, we saw that the mycoplasma was filling a niche when the normal pathogens weren't there. 
So the patients were being treated for their streptococci and their haemophilus, and that left a niche with this, which this rare mycoplasma was able to grow through into. And so in that, and that became the predominant pathogen. And it was only in these patients who were immunosuppressed and had got problems. So it was a combination of the host biology, their immunosuppression, and also the antibiotic treatment for the normal pathogens, if you like, the typical respiratory pathogens. And this mycoplasma um, for reformy grew through in that setting. And we see sort of those sorts of examples across the um, infection, infection community. Right. OK, so I think we've got time for one final question. So let's end today's session um, on a very kind of future orientated question. What do you see as the biggest obstacle to advance past the antibiotic discovery void? Yeah, so, um, well, I think if I knew the answer to that, <laughs> I'd, I'd be in a different position. So there's all sorts of things. I think that, you know, biology is very complicated and so there's not going to be one solution. We need to think about discovery science and understanding how bacteria work. So that needs to be enhanced. We need to understand and improve our ability to manage infections and you know, go back to that antibiotic stewardship and make sure that works. And then there's a real issue around economics and making antibiotic development economical for drug companies. We have to accept that we live in a world where you need drug companies to create those antibiotics and they need to be able to, they've got to serve their funders and their, so there has to be a model for funding antibiotics, which development and rollout, which makes sense to those, those companies. And yeah, actually we've seen it with the, you know, the vaccines uh, for COVID that actually we've been able to intervene with that by putting big government money or big charitable monies behind it. But that's not a model which will sustain pharmaceutical companies forever. So, so there's fundamental biology, antibiotic stewardship, and then a model for how we manage the development of new antibiotics. So how we go from that fundamental biology through to something on the shelf. OK, so I think that kind of marks the end of today's lecture. Thank you so much to everyone for joining and thank you, Professor McHugh, for giving such an interesting lecture on something that kind of, you know, always always needs more attention on. Um, thank you for sending through your questions and obviously please send through any emails if you feel like you haven't got your questions answered. Um, but I think that's all for now. Take care, everyone. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Bye.